something strange that only the Bible can explain is happening in the river Euphrates. Think about where you stand right now. Consider the very ground beneath your feet. Now dive deeper in your mind and think about what lies at the very core of this earth we call home. You see, the Bible, God's own word, gives us hints. It gives us glimpses of mysterious happenings at the center of the earth. Now, let me tell you folks, it ain't all sunshine and rainbows down there. No, sir. There are strange, yes, very strange things the good book says about the belly of this world. In the pages of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John talks about a bottomless pit. The imagery, my friends, is haunting. It's as if there is a whole realm, a cavernous void right beneath our feet, where things of the spirit world are confined. There are spirit beings, demonic armies bound in the bottomless pit. These are demonic beings bound in chains, waiting for a moment. The scripture foretells of the time when the boundaries that God has put in place, that thin veil between our world and theirs, will be torn apart. And when that happens, oh dear ones, these demonic entities, once confined, will flood into our world. They'll be set loose unrestrained. There is a massive problem with a lot of modern day preaching. Many pastors want to make everything black and white and cut and dry, so they avoid big topics such as these. Some ministers even preach against the fact that there is a real spirit world. But people of God, there is a real spirit world far bigger than you and I could ever imagine. A real spirit world with beings far greater and more intelligent than you and I. Within this universe you live in, there are forces at play far beyond you and I. Now, this spirit realm, it's vast, incomprehensibly vast, populated with beings that possess wisdom and power that would make the mightiest among us look feeble. Can you grasp the vastness of our universe? Can you fathom its depth? Friends, our time on this earth is but a blip a fleeting moment. Most of us will barely touch 100 years on this earth. What is 100 years in the timeline of eternity? We think we know so much, but in reality, our knowledge is limited. Consider this. We've explored less than 5% of our own oceans. Less than 5%. Yes, you heard that correct. Less than 5% percent, the vast deep blue sea on our planet remains a mystery. And when you gaze up at the sky, ponder on this. Humanity has only set foot on Earth and our moon. That's not even a fraction of the vast expanse of space. Only Earth and the moon have been visited by humans, so less than 0.1 percent of space has been explored. If we know so little about our physical world, how much more mysterious is the spirit realm? A realm that transcends our tangible reality. There are things in the scripture, deep things, things that make you scratch your head, especially when it talks about the depths of this earth. We might think we've achieved the pinnacle of understanding, but folks, we're just scratching the surface. We're like toddlers trying to understand the mechanics of a jet engine. Human pride deceives us into thinking we've got it all figured out, but in God's grand tapestry, our knowledge is but a thread. So, before we stand tall, thinking we have all the answers, let's humble ourselves and recognize how little we truly understand about God's magnificent creation, both seen and unseen. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The spirit world, ladies and gentlemen, is far bigger than the human mind, far, far bigger than the human mind. And this Bible, this Bible tells us that there is a real spirit world. 
We need to stop attempting to simplify things for the human mind. The Bible tells us there are some strange things under our feet. Revelations 9 verses 1 through 3. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fell from heaven onto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and onto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. However, we are not going to focus on the bottomless pit today and the great army that comes forth from the bottomless pit. We are going to focus on the river Euphrates. Revelation 9, verses 13 through 15. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The release of the four angels at the great river Euphrates marks a turning point in the book of Revelations. The first four trumpets were a warning, a call to repentance, and an invitation to turn to God. But the fifth and sixth trumpets were more severe, and their judgments are directed specifically against those who refuse to repent. In the first woe, mankind is not killed, but rather tormented by demonic locusts, and their leader, Apollyon, the destroyer. No one dies during this time. However, during the second woe, a powerful army is unleashed to kill a third of mankind. According to the scripture, when the sixth trumpet sounds, four angels who had been bound at the great river Euphrates are released. These angels were specifically prepared for this significant event. Although we do not know who prepared them, they were bound for this particular hour and for a divine purpose. While it is uncertain whether these angels are considered bad, it is likely that they are evil angels. I personally believe they are the evil angels because no holy angel would be bound. Nevertheless, regardless of their nature, they serve the divine purpose. The reason these angels were bound specifically at the river Euphrates and not any other river is not explicitly stated in the scripture. However, the Euphrates River holds significant symbolism throughout the Bible. It is associated with several significant events and places. In Genesis 2 verses 10 through 14, it is linked to the first sin and the location of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 4 verse 16, it is connected to the first murder. The river is also mentioned in Genesis 14 verse 1 where it is associated with the First War Confederation, and in Genesis 10, verses 8 through 10, where it is linked with the First Dictatorship. Additionally, the river Euphrates holds significance as a landmark of Babylon. Babylon represents human pride, rebellion, and idolatry. It was the first great empire that persecuted God's people. The river also served as a crucial military asset, providing protection to the city of Babylon from invasion. While the exact reason for binding the angels at the Euphrates is not explicitly explained, these associations highlight the historical and symbolic importance of the river in relation to rebellion, sin, and the opposition faced by God's people throughout biblical history. Revelations 9 verses 16 through 19. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire, 
and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tail. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. The description of the horsemen in Revelations 9 verses 16 through 19 is indeed strange and grotesque, presenting a vivid image of horror and destruction and a connection to the demonic realm. Some have suggested that these horsemen represent a natural army of men. The peculiar description could be symbolic of modern warfare, with its mechanized equipment and advanced weaponry. It is possible that John in his limited understanding, use these vivid terms to depict the technology of his time. However, upon careful examination, it becomes clear that the description does not align with conventional war horses or modern military equipment like fighter jets or tanks. The imagery goes beyond what can be attributed to human technology. Therefore, a safer interpretation may be to understand this is a literal army of 200 million, but not composed of human beings from a specific nation. Instead, it signifies a demonic army invading the earth, held in bondage by the Lord until the appointed time when God grants them permission to unleash their destructive power. As I stated at the start of this sermon, there are some strange things under the earth. This interpretation aligns with the earlier description of the demonic locusts in the same chapter. The idea of a demonic army fits within the overall context of Revelation and the spiritual warfare depicted throughout the book. It emphasizes the forces of evil being unleashed upon the world during the end times, working in accordance with God's divine plan and strange demonic spirits coming up onto the earth. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 through 21. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. It is indeed surprising that despite witnessing the remarkable events described in the book of Revelation, including the sounding of seven trumpets, catastrophic natural disasters, the torment of demonic locusts, and the rise of Apollyon the destroyer, the people on earth remain unrepentant. One would expect that such extraordinary occurrences would lead them to recognize the gravity of their actions and turn to God. Consider the sounding of seven trumpets. Each trumpet brought forth a different judgment or catastrophe upon the earth, serving as a clear sign of divine intervention. These calamities, such as hail mixed with blood, a burning mountain cast into the sea, and darkened skies, should have prompted a deep reflection on their sinful ways. But men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, and they refused to repent. Furthermore, the torment caused by the demonic locusts with Apollyon leading their destructive charge should have shaken their hearts and caused them to seek mercy and forgiveness. The very presence of such demonic forces should have served as a wake-up call, exposing the darkness of their deeds and the need for repentance. But men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, and they refused to repent. Yet despite all these astonishing events and divine judgments, the people stubbornly persist in their sinful ways. It reveals the depth of their spiritual condition and the hardness of their hearts. Even when faced with God's righteous judgment, they remain unyielding, clinging to their sinful lifestyles. In the book of Revelation, there is a striking depiction of people who would rather seek death than repent. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, it is written that they recognized the judgment of God unfolding before their eyes. They were aware of the magnitude of His power and authority, to the point that they longed for mountains to fall on them, seeking escape from the impending judgment. This portrayal reveals the depth of their hardness of heart and stubborn rebellion. 
Despite witnessing the undeniable truth of God's existence and His righteous judgment, they chose to resist repentance. It highlights the tragic reality of individuals who, in the face of God's mercy and call for transformation, obstinately cling to their sinful ways, unwilling to turn from their wickedness. It serves as a reminder of the importance of a softened heart and a willingness to humbly submit to God, acknowledging our need for His forgiveness and salvation. This stubbornness demonstrates the fallen state of humanity. It shows how deeply ingrained sin can be, blinding individuals to the reality of their need for salvation and preventing them from embracing God's mercy. It is a tragic reflection of the human tendency to resist divine grace, even in the face of overwhelming evidence. However, it is crucial to remember that God's ultimate desire is for all people to come to repentance and experience His redeeming love. The events unfolding in Revelation serve as warnings and opportunities for individuals to turn away from their sin and embrace God's forgiveness. Though the people's response may be disheartening, it underscores the importance of persistently sharing the message of salvation and interceding for those who are still lost in their unrepentant ways. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 through 21, we witness a sobering truth. People will be worshiping demons. It is a thought that may seem difficult to grasp, but if we honestly reflect on the state of our world today, we can see glimpses of this reality already unfolding. In our present society, it is becoming increasingly common for Satan and his influences to be celebrated and embraced. The deceptions and lies spread by the enemy are subtly creeping into various aspects of our lives, often masked as normal or even progressive ideologies. The values and principles rooted in God's truth are being challenged and replaced with a distorted moral compass. The media, entertainment industry, and popular culture often glorify behaviors and beliefs that directly contradict God's teaching. What was once considered immoral or sinful is now celebrated and applauded. Satan is paraded around, sometimes under the guise of freedom or personal expression, encouraging people to indulge in activities that are contrary to God's design for our lives. The worship of demons mentioned in Revelation reminds us of the spiritual battle at hand. Satan seeks to deceive and draw people away from God's truth, enticing them to worship anything other than the one true God. This can manifest in various ways, such as idolizing material possessions, fame, power, or even engaging in occult practices that invite demonic influence. As followers of Christ, it is crucial to be vigilant and discerning. We must be aware of the subtle lies and influences of the enemy in our surroundings. Our world may be walking in a direction that embraces and normalizes the worship of demons, but as believers, we are called to stand firm in our faith and to be a light in the midst of darkness. Our task is to live according to God's word, sharing the truth and love of Christ with those around us. We must not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Through prayer, study of Scripture, and reliance on the Holy Spirit, we can navigate these challenging times and be a beacon of hope in a world that desperately needs the redeeming grace of Jesus. Let us remember that God's power is greater than any force of darkness, and as we stand firmly in Him, we can resist the temptations and deceptions of Satan. In doing so, we can be a testament to His love and truth, shining a light that exposes the emptiness of worshiping anything other than the one true God.